Hi, good evening everybody. Thank you for joining us for our Instagram Live. I'm Louise, I'm one of the clinical nurse specialists here at Breast Cancer Now. And I'm going to be joined live tonight by Kristen from Bracca Chatter. Um, I'll just wait for her to join. Um, so we're gonna be talking to Kristen about her experience of um, being BRCA2 positive. Um, so I'm just waiting for her request. While we wait for her request, I just thought I'd let you know, we're currently um, doing a survey. Um, ah, it's saying she's, no. Sorry, we're doing a survey and um, to, to really sort of um, evaluate our Facebook and Instagram lives. So at the end, if you click on our bio, um, you should be able to, um, to complete that for us. Now, um, let's see. No. Here we go, see if I can send a request to. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, oh, that's always the, the sort of gut wrenching bit. Of the I beginning. know, I pressed it twice and I was like, it's not, what's happening? I'm oh, here. How are you, Kristen? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Now that first bit's out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just really introducing what we're going to be talking about tonight, which is sort of your experience of having a BRCA2 mutation. Um, but I thought just before we sort of go into uh, sort of you sharing your experience, um, just for those at home who may be less familiar with what BRCA is, just a brief explanation. So I was just going to sort of very simplistically explain sort of what BRCA1 and BRCA2 are. So for those of you at home who are watching, um, we all have BRCA genes and I think often that's a misconception really is you think that somebody is a BRCA carrier so they've got these additional genes but actually we've all got BRCA genes and um, they play a really important function in um, their tr what we call tumour suppressor genes. So they sort of um, regulate the system and, and reduce our chance or protect us from getting particular cancers. In the instance of BRCA, which is breast cancer gene, um, it, it can protect us from breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And the reason I mention ovarian cancer, um, even though we're a breast cancer charity, is obviously the importance of that. And also the importance to highlight is that it is um, Ovarian Cancer Awareness Month. Um, so uh, I just thought I would, would raise that really. So if um, we all have genes that we inherit from our parents and we get a copy from each parent, and if we inherit 140 um, copy from one of our parents, then we can go on to have an increased risk of developing cancers. So breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So that's very much it in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah, I always say the BRCA, BRCA are the good guys. So yeah. people say I have BRCA, they don't mean that because <laughs> everyone has BRCA. You have a BRCA mutation, so BRCA is a good thing. <laughs> yeah. So, um, do you, should we start by just sort of um, giving a sort of a bit of a background to to your story and how you found out you were your BRCA two positive? Yeah, yeah. So, I my mum was diagnosed with ovarian cancer, a rare form of ovarian cancer called primary peritoneal, and I think because it's such a rare form, and because of her age, and she was, you know, she epitomised health. She was really, really healthy woman. They tested her for BRCA um, or BRCA mutation and it was a bit of a surprise because most most time people have quite a lot of cancer in their family so that's why because it runs in the family and that people think this you know this must be genetic but with us mm -hmm. it was just my mum it was just my mum who'd had cancer and my great aunt Marge who lived till she was like nearly 100 so it came as a bit of a shock that she had this BRCA mutation and she sadly found out a couple of couple of weeks before she died and she she just had no idea what that meant so yeah. I remember her texting me I was in a sunny beer garden she just texted me saying I've got BRCA basically thinking I'd have it as well so she at that time I think that was where I thought I had BRCA because she texted me saying I've got this thing you need to go and seek some help <laughs> bless her yeah. she went very well when she sent that but that's that's kind of how we found out about BRCA in our family yeah. um and then I got tested, so she died in August and I went and got tested straight away because I just, for me, I, I wanted to know and I know some people prefer to wait for, for a few years and 
the genetic counsel is very much like you've just lost your mum. Are you sure you want to go through all of this at the yeah. moment? I, I just wanted to know. I assumed I had it. And I thought if I don't have it, that, you know, if I don't have the mutation, that's a bonus. But I just assumed I had. And I yeah. found out, I don't know how long it took to get the results. I think it was a few months for me. Um, and that yeah. does depend on, you know, what where you are in the country. Um, but I think it's a few months. And I found out, yeah, probably like maybe six months after she died, I think. I had and how old were you when you got tested? I was 27. Or maybe, yeah, I was 27 when I found out. Um and again, across the country, the advice is different depending where you are. But for me, at the time, that time I was in Norfolk, they said, we're not going to do anything till you're 30. I was bracket two, um, or I am bracket two. So it was kind of like, you've got it, but because we're not, they don't start screening, well, at that time, they didn't start screening till you're 30. They wouldn't consider a mastectomy until I was 30. So it was like, I knew I had it, but it wasn't such a big deal. Like it, it didn't feel ominous, like something was gonna get me very soon. So I kind of was very good at putting it out my head, but <laughs> my friends and family kept kind of like, what are you gonna do? Oh my God, have you thought about it? And I was just like, it's not, it didn't feel like a big deal for me. I don't yeah, know, it's yeah. very good. At and I think it. just going back to, to things you raised about sort of the, the 30 cutoff point very recently, that there's some um, screening. So there's sort of two options to manage um, when you f find out that you've got a, sort of a, 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 a genetic uh, mutation is you can either go down the screening or the surveillance route, or you can go down the surgical route. And I think it is really difficult because up until very recently with the screening, it doesn't start until the age of 30. So yeah. you may found out much, much earlier and lots of people can find that's really difficult because you've got the knowledge that you've got this increased risk but actually you've got limited options and you're absolutely right. I think it varies massively throughout the country as to when people um, are sort of um, can go ahead with risk reducing surgery. Yeah. And, and I, I think, think again, it's, it's scary as well because I know women in their twenties who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, who've got a BRCA gene mutation. So it feels a bit, it's a very uncomfortable position to be in. Um, mm. And I know women, you know, as long, young as I think like 20, Early, early 20s who've had mastectomies especially BRCA1 positive um, and I know some some areas of the country they say they don't even bother testing until people are 10 30 so it is different and I think that's really important because you do have to advocate and you do have to kind of know information to be able to push for things because yeah. if you if that's not sitting comfortably with you and you, you think about your family history I was told that you should take off 10 years from when your relative had, your older relative had a diagnosis. So if your mum had breast cancer when she was 42, you should consider stuff when you're 32. So if you've had a parent, you know, a mother who's had breast cancer in her 20s and you're in your 20s and they're saying, no, we're not going to do anything, you, have, you do have to push, unfortunately. Yeah. To kind of and I, th I think it is it, it, again it's sort of it, it is very much going back to your genetics team and and yeah. although the risks are increased uh, for for different people I think it very much as you say it based on their family so if there is a pattern of much younger cancers yeah. at, at much cancers at a much younger age I think that the, the, the genetics team can support you in your decision yeah. making yeah um in 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 when you go decide to go ahead and have that, that have was hard for me because my mum didn't have breast cancer you know she had ovarian cancer when she was 60 so it just it, the actual breast cancer side of things never really felt like it was a huge risk whereas you know if you've had aunties and sisters and and pair, you know mothers and grandmothers who've had breast cancer you really feel that need and that push to get that mastectomy whereas I didn't feel that <laughs> so I was a bit like I'll be fine <laughs> yeah yeah um, yeah, and I think just before we move on, there was we had we've had quite a, quite a few questions in, but one of them was from a, a, um, somebody called Maz, and she's twenty five, and she's asked, "What can I do to see if I'm going to get it? My mum has it, and my nan died of it." Mm -hmm. And I think sort of just before we go on, I think the first starting point for anyone if they feel that they have a significant family history, when we talk about lots of people will have a family history where they have a member or two who have cancers because cancer is common particularly yeah. breast cancer is the most common female cancer in the uk so it's highly likely that most people will know somebody in their family that has had breast cancer and um, actually, as well breast cancer most women who have breast cancer do not have gene mutations and that's, that's really important really important yeah yeah 
Yeah. yeah. So only a small number will have what we call a significant family history mm. and then be eligible for genetic testing. So I think as if you've got two, and when we talk about sort of relatives as well, it's very important we talk about refer to them as first degree relatives and second degree relatives. So when we talk about a first degree relative, we often mean a parent or a sibling. So um, I think it's definitely worth having a conversation with the GP about your family history and, and, and possibly getting a referral to a family history clinic. And I, I would suggest as well reading up quite a lot about it because I know some people's experience with their GPs is they've gone in there with more information than the GP has because they're not going to be experts in all sorts of, you know, genetic yeah. or whatever so do research as well and try and there are tools online where you can kind of figure out what your risk is so you can have a look yeah. at that yeah but in it's terms of it because she says if my, my grandma and my mother have it if she means the gene then she'll be eligible for testing if her mother has it but if she means breast cancer she then... said she's wondering if she's got yeah she, yeah absolutely right if she's going to get yeah. it so it might be the gene yeah but, yeah and note on that if it's your mother or your father who has the gene mutation then you have a 50 percent chance of having it as well and that again is a misconception that it doesn't impact men because it still carries down the male line and increases risk of certain cancers for men as well yeah yeah and while we're talking about testing uh, sort of if do you have any other siblings or members of the family that have undergone testing oh, i've got a huge family <laughs> <laughs> i've got four brothers um and only one of them has been tested and he is also bracket two positive um and then i have two of my uncles so my mum's two brothers are both bracket positive and between them they have a big load of children but i don't think any of my cousins have tested positive yet which is fabulous i'm really yeah i don't think they have but my brother has and then three of my brothers haven't been tested yet and again that's the thing it, is, it can be really weird in a family because some people have that approach like me just go straight straight ahead and do it and others really are not interested and they don't want to know and they don't want to frighten themselves so it can be really weird between siblings <laughs> having yeah. that different and I think, approach. Absolutely I think there is sort of advantages and disadvantages for testing and people will, will sort of mm. evaluate what, what they feel is right for them I think there isn't a right or a wrong and some people yeah. find that they want to know and they want to have all the information and then manage their risks accordingly and others just feel that that would be too much anxiety to live with yeah um, so there is no right or wrong decision when it comes to to decision and, as you say I, and again in my experience in the NHS is so many families will have different views and decide yeah. to do different things yeah definitely and, and yeah. that's it as part of accepting that people are going to take different approaches yeah so you decided to go down the um surgical route the risk reducing route and how easy was that of a decision to come to not easy <laughs> not easy it really wasn't and again partly because i didn't feel a huge amount of risk from it because my mum didn't have breast cancer so and i i was very same with a lot of women love hate boob relationship but I had a very big chest um I was like 28 double f and I always saw it as quite a big part of who I was like physically like how I looked um and yeah it was a it was a horrible decision to make it really was it really was mm -hmm. um and I felt very alone I didn't really know anybody who'd I didn't know anybody at all who had the operation um so and, and it's, it's something my friends are at, uh, fantastic, but it's so hard to empathise and, and talk about something like this if you haven't been through it, which is why yeah. it is so important. But yeah, it was a hard decision to make. And, but I did it actually quite quickly because they said, we won't do anything till you're 30. And as soon as I turned 30, I was walking straight in that surgeon's door. <laughs> so, tell me tell me everything and I went in there not really thinking I would have the operation but there was a huge part of me that felt it sounds a bit silly in hindsight but I really felt my life was on hold and that it was hanging over me and I was kind of like do I have kids do I breastfeed at the time I was in a relationship and it was kind of pressurizing us to have kids so that I could breastfeed and get that kind of experience um yeah. And then in my relationship, we basically weren't in the position to have kids. And I just thought, why wait? 
and at that time as well a lot of my friends were having babies and they had a totally different perspective and they were like as a mum <laughs> it will be hard to have a mastectomy yeah. I know you know some women don't have that choice but yeah a lot of my friends just said do it when you have no commitments responsibilities you know it's just you you've just got to look after yourself recovery will be easier so yeah I think I didn't want I was really like reluctant to make that decision I really didn't want anyone to tell me to do it but the more people said it's a good idea <laughs> the more I was like all right yeah and I think again you raise a really important point about timing when is the right time and nobody can tell you that when is the right time because some people may never go on to develop breast cancer and 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 others as you say it sort of hangs over you so you are sort of held there and you can't sort of move forwards with it because it's sort of hanging in the background and it is about when in life is the right time and I think only you as an individual will know when it's the right time or, or some people don't know when it's the right time but sort of just anxiety levels might push them into that decision as well yeah it is it was a lot about the anxiety of just just knowing you have to do something <laughs> And waiting for it just get it over and done with in my head and also mm. I suppose at that time I was starting to kind of get involved in the BRCA community a lot more and I knew women who who were my age who had cancer and that made it more real for me I suppose um yeah and my genetic counsellor was really because you can have screening like you said yeah. earlier you can have yearly MRIs and mammograms and I remember saying, oh, maybe I'll just do that and I'll wait. And, you know, if I get cancer, then I'll catch it early and sort it. And she was just like, no. <laughs> She's like, if you have cancer, I'm sorry, but you, you could still die even if we catch it early. And that really stuck in my head. I was yeah. like, okay, so screening isn't cancer prevention. Screening is catching it early with hope, yeah. so you know, recovery. But, yeah, that stuck in my head. Um, yeah. And did you go with a sort of thought in mind about what type of reconstruction or even if you wanted reconstruction? I, I definitely wanted reconstruction. Um, it's funny because at the beginning, I don't know, I'm sure a lot of women go through this as well. You want, it, I wanted the same size. I wanted them to look amazing. And then the more you learn about the complications and the things that can go wrong, I was just like, I just don't, I just want it to go fine. I just want to have something. <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. care. I just want something um and I didn't really have a choice because of my body size and shape because you can have your own tissue so df or from wherever in your body made into breasts but I didn't have any tissue on me um any like excess tissue and because my boobs were big <laughs> my surgeon like squeezed my stomach and he was like you'll have boobs the size of walnuts uh. <laughs> so the only option was to have implants for me yeah. Um, and actually, I went into the operation not knowing whether he would put them over or under the muscle. So I right. didn't know whether I would wake up, you know, kind of flatter and then have to be expanded or just have them straight in. And they said that really depended on like my skin and, you know, just how healthy I was when they cut me open. So I went in blindly <laughs> to yeah. this operation. And I I know it's really important to know what your choices are and to do your research and if you're uncomfortable with what your surgeon's saying then you can challenge it and you can go to any surgeon in the country but I really trusted my surgeon and I just he he was wonderful and I just said whatever you think's best for me you know you're yeah. the expert here so yeah. that I think made it easier <laughs> Yeah, you've raised really important points there about sort of just um, feeling comfortable in your decision and, and having the confidence in your surgeon. And certainly if you don't feel comfortable, you can ask for a second opinion yes. and, 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 and ask to be referred. So it, it's, it's a big, it's a life changing operation and it's something you have to live with for the rest of your life. So you need to be comfortable in that. Yeah, you need to trust them. And, and my surgeon was very good emotionally as well. He really understood how I would feel. And he asked me all of those questions to make sure I was mentally prepared for it um so yeah he was brilliant i did ask him once i said what what would happen if i went privately <laughs> he said you'd still have me as your surgeon you'd just be paying for it and i was like mm, I'll, I'll stick with the nhs <laughs> yeah 
and did um, you have a discussion about nipples? Because that's another thing that um, can vary greatly. Yes. Um, as to yeah. whether you can keep, sometimes you can keep them through choice and other times it's because of the technique or the surgery that, that may limit your options. Yeah, I wasn't, again, it wasn't really a choice to keep mine. Um, it probably would have been possible, but because I had large breasts and because they were slightly saggy by that time, he said in order to keep my nipples, they would have to, it, he basically said they'd end up in a very weird position and then he would have to trim them down and then they wouldn't even look like my nipples at the end of the day anyway. So it wasn't a huge deal for me, but I know some women in that situation will have, I don't know the medical term, but like a boob lift first so that their yeah. nipples are up <laughs> so that then they can sew them back on. Yeah. But that's two operations and, I just it's a two stage operation. And there is a tiny, tiny risk of cancer being developing in the leftover nipple tissue. It's very small. Yeah. But I just didn't want to go through that whole mastectomy and recovery to still have any kind of anxiety about getting breast cancer. So I just thought as much if you can eliminate as much risk as possible, then yeah. that's that was good for me. Yeah. Yeah. And and again, you sort of it's important to sort of highlight that is is risk reducing surgery, even with mastectomies, never gives you a zero chance that you can develop breast cancer because the skin that's um, obviously that all of the breast tissue is removed. Not every single cell can be removed. So there is a very small chance and much smaller than the sort of the general population after you've had this operation. But again, it's it, it's never zero risk. Yeah. And I think, again, with the nipple, some people choose that because it's a very small increase risk and it, again it comes down to individual sort of decision making yeah. as to what they feel is acceptable for them i think i've done quite a lot of research on like nipple sparing and the main reason to keep them is is more about the psychological recovery because your boobs look much more like boobs with nipples on yeah. them so it is a lot about the psychological recovery but i also because i've you know spoken to a lot of women about it and most, I think most are very happy with it, but there are complications with keeping your nipples. And I don't think we are explained or we, you know, doctors or surgeons tell us what can go wrong so much. Because some women have come out and said, this was, I was never told that this would be happening. So, yeah, there's, yeah. but and I think most I speak to are really happy with them, really happy with their nipples. <laughs> But the thing to point out again is it's about managing expectations and having all of that knowledge because the nipples are there in sort of they're there, but they don't have the same sensation, the same as the no. breast. So you will lose lose sensation. And they're, that's really important when discussing, obviously, with the surgeon and the team about sort of the expectations following surgery. Interestingly, so they, they said that to me about not having any feeling and that freaked me out. I think that freaks a lot of women out thinking you don't have any feeling, but I've got a lot more than I thought I would. <laughs> like I can feel all across the top, round the sides. It's mainly like underneath that I don't have sensation, but you can still feel, so you can still feel pressure because you feel the pressure on your body. Yeah. When you're touching. So it's not, it's not as numb. I thought I'd just be numb all over and it's not like that. Um, they say that and then the other weird thing is that they're cold cold to touch um, and again I was imagining like freezing cold boobs all the time and it's not it's not like that I do notice it sometimes um, like if I'm in the bath and they're like ice cold but it's not enough to really bother me I know it, it can be worse for some women but yeah it doesn't bother me a huge amount yeah yeah and how did you recover how was your sort of recovery from your operation i was fine i you know i know it's different for everybody and i don't again not getting expectations really high but i was completely fine and i i was off work for i think six weeks but i genuinely after two weeks was feeling guilty that i was not back at work because i was like i could definitely be sitting in an office working don't don't because you think you're all right you're still healing inside but yeah I the pain I would say if I wasn't moving so if I was just sitting still I wouldn't feel any pain it was only when I like would move like this that I would feel it um I was in hospital for 24 hours um they gave me a single paracetamol because I didn't weigh enough to have two paracetamols. <laughs> I was like, 
this is ridiculous. I've had a mastectomy and you're giving me one paracetamol. <laughs> but yeah. I really, you know, I didn't, it was so much less painful than I thought it would be. Did you go home with drains? I went home with the drains, yeah. I kept them for only five days, but they, they're annoying. <laughs> I would say more than anything, because you've got your wires coming out of you, they kind of get, get tangled and you can feel them tugging a little bit under your skin. Um, so they were probably the most annoying part about having a mastectomy. But yeah, they yeah. did. I know some hospitals, they don't like you going home when you've still got them in, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot, to, and I think you're absolutely right. From my experiences, they can be very annoying, the drains, um, they, they, just because, sort of, yeah, they're big, they're bulky. Um, sometimes they can fall out. Um, and for some people, they can be really uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, they, they can be more sort of causing pain when the drains are in, particularly sort of where they are. Yeah, they, mine were on my ribs. And then, so I've got that on my ribs, and then I had compression dressing and a mastectomy bra on and it was all just like uncomfortable I'd say not painful but just like digging digging my ribs <laughs> yeah. yeah um let me see if there's a couple of questions um that we haven't that I've, I've um I know that we were I was going to raise earlier Linda asked do I need to get the BRCA test to have risk reducing surgery um from sort of a healthcare professional view most people will need to go under, uh, undergo genetic testing before they would be offered risk reducing. In some high risk families, um, the genetics team may feel that the risk is high enough to consider it. But I would say the majority of people would have to have genetic testing before yeah. they could have. I'm, I do. I know some one person who's done it privately. Obviously, you can do whatever you want privately. Um, but yeah, there there are mutations that we don't know about aren't there they're still we're still learning so much about this area that um yeah I, we know people who have got genetic links we just don't know what they are yet so yeah yes yeah, so yeah. there's changes that, that that are coming up and i think research is is definitely ongoing and we're learning so much more about genes than we did maybe five ten years ago um what we don't know is whether they're harmless changes or whether they will increase the risk to develop cancer and i think sometimes when we don't have or the genetics team don't have that information then they may look at patterns within a family and they can estimate somebody's risk by that stage and so it might be on smaller occasions that they could still um recommend either increased surveillance so either mammograms or mris regularly or whether for some people it's risk reducing surgery and i think the other question um that we had was how long can i wait to have my ovaries out i'm BRCA one positive and scared of side side effects and that's from victoria and i think again it, it it's really about sort of going back to the team because they will talk about what your risk is. We know that it's different for BRCA1 and BRCA2. And you may, what have you been advised with regards to sort of ovaries, Kristen? I was advised to wait until I'm 40, 40 plus and after having kids, obviously. Um, but I, again, know some BRCA2s who've been advised younger than that. So, yeah, like you say, it depends on your family history. And again, I think actually using the word advised is, 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 is a difficult one with genetics because really it's just showing you what the risks are. And there is no sort of yes or no, as we said earlier. So the, the team will talk about what your individual risk is. And it, it, some people may choose not to have their ovaries removed and others will. So it's such an individual situation. So I don't think the team would recommend one way or the other. They would present the information and allow you to make an informed Excellent. decision <laughs> but there i mean there's the protector study at the moment in the uk and that's about removing the tubes because they believe that most ovarian cancer actually starts in the tubes the fallopian tubes so they'll remove them and hopefully that means that you know there'll, there'll be a delay in like um pre-induced menopause so the side effects aren't as severe and i know a lot of women have opted that route hoping to have natural menopause and then they will have their ovaries removed at a little bit of a later stage so that's really positive that's yeah really as you mentioned that is a study currently so that would be you'd have to be sort of entered into that study to do that and i think if you want any further information the two i'm thinking of the ovarian target ovarian cancer and the eve appeal yeah, are two good charities as well ovarian cancer action do loads of um information and 
kind of advice around um, BRCA as well. Yeah. And I've just seen, I'm not very good at doing two things at once, but I've just seen a question pop up. It says, I have POW B2, um, Coco Lovely, and have had breast cancer. Should I think of having my ovaries removed? I'm over 50. I think the advice really would be to go back to your team, um, both your breast cancer team and your genetics team, and they would be able to give you the advice on, on what really is the best way forwards for you. Right, so going back um, to you, where, where would you say, Kristen, that you gained sort of your support from uh, during and after having your sort of... <laughs> I, I have an incredible support network. I've got amazing family and friends. Um, and I guess I eventually found there's a charity in Norfolk. Um, there are different areas of the country as well, but I found them in Norfolk called Keeping Abreast, and they, they were brilliant. Um, and it was through Keeping Abreast that I met, I think, my first kind of BRCA buddy. It's the first person I'd ever met in real life who'd had BRCA or has BRCA. And she was 10 years ahead of me. <laughs> so she was great. And it's a weird, like, as soon as you meet someone with BRCA, you just have an instant kind of connection because you've got so much, it's like family history, you've got so much to talk about. And I just remember sitting there, blah, 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 to her. And she was, she really, really helped me out um so I guess it was through keeping abreast um but I genuinely like for the first few years I felt so alone so alone mm. and I didn't I guess I didn't even realize that there were other people out there like me um who were you know making the same decisions that I was so I think Instagram is incredible like I think that's where that's where it started I I got like an anonymous Instagram account without my name, without anything, without any pictures, just so I could look at other women's stories. Yeah. I was like a little hiding behind the screen, just like looking at other women's reconstructions. And then I just thought, why not? You know, at the time I was, I work in domestic abuse. So I was sharing, I, a lot of women share their stories about recovery and, you know, surviving domestic abuse. And I was like, if they can share what they've been through I can share what I've been through because I could see the impact that that has so that's yeah. kind of they kind of gave me a lot of courage to think why am I hiding behind this screen I might as well just start sharing my story and yeah. I just you know I think I've said it so many times that in a way I feel like it's worth it because of the women I've met through this journey like I've met some real friends for life and you know and it's so incredible sharing that. I'll have women message me from their hospital bed, like sending me pictures of their mastectomy. And I love it. I love that connection that you can have through trauma, through going through something so traumatic. Um, so I really hope over the next sort of few years, we get better in the UK about yeah. our community. And, and I know when, yeah, I know when we've spoken on the phone um, mm. a few weeks back, I think sort of that you, you'd mentioned that you didn't want to contact a breast cancer charity as such and, and that you've heard people saying that. And, and it's really sort of important to highlight, although we're a breast cancer charity, we're here for anyone affected by breast cancer. So you don't have to have had breast cancer uh, to contact us. We're here for sort of breast health, breast information. And we do have a service called Someone Like Me, um, which is a peer support service. So somebody can uh, be put in touch with um, a volunteer who is trained to support you either online or um, on the telephone. And we have people that have had breast cancer who have BRCA. Uh, and we also have people that don't have, haven't had breast cancer and are BRCA um, sort of um, BRCA positive. So you can be put in touch with them. And certainly that would, would hopefully have helped you out at the time. But in response to that, do you want to sort of talk a bit about what you've sort of set up um, uh, similarly? Yeah, as a peer so, I mean, my uh, BRCA body system is a little bit um, basic, <laughs> but at the moment I'm just a lot of a lot of women who are or, or men who are feeling alone. If they message me, I've got like a I'm building this spreadsheet of whereabouts they are in the country and kind of just just putting them in touch and then leaving them to it. You know, there's nothing that I don't I don't get involved. I just it's a little bit like a matchmaking, my own little matchmaking service because. Yeah, I've done it. I've done it for a little while. And then it's when people get back in contact with you, or you haven't spoken to them and they get back in contact saying, thank you so much. Like that's really meeting that person really changed 
my whole experience. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, I know a lot of people, so I might as well start kind of putting them in contact with each other. So I started that. And then I guess the main thing that I think people are finding useful at the moment is I've done the mastectomy gallery um, on my website, which one of the big issues that a lot of us have had is we've gone into this operation having no idea what the reconstruction is going to look like. Yeah. And that's horrible going in blind. It's like, we say it's like getting a tattoo and not knowing what your tattoo is going to be and you've got it for life. And <clears throat> so I have had amazing, lots of amazing women who have sent me pictures and they can do it anonymously or they can yeah. a lot of them choose to have their name on it because then people can get in contact and ask them questions about what kind of reconstruction they had so I think that is that's the thing I'm kind of most proud of not that I've only pulled it together I'm, I'm most proud of the women who kind of have sent their pictures in but um and up, we'll, we'll put a link to your website which is called Bracker Chat on 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 the chat so people can link to that because again I've had a look at it and I think that's a lot of when we talk to people on our helpline mm -hmm. and people want to sort of envisage what that's like it's 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 I always sort of say looking at pictures sometimes it can be a bit scary looking mm -hmm. at pictures because they're at different stages some are very early on post-operatively and others are sort of a bit further on and I, but I think it's important if you can ask your surgeon to see his work yeah. So it, again, it, it's difficult because they may only show that they, they'll show you sort of a selection of, of what they do. But to see sort of you can look at images online and, and really get a good sense of what is the potential. And I think, again, it goes back to what we mentioned before about having realistic or sort of managing your expectations yeah. and going into it, having that knowledge. I think I saw some pictures from my surgeon. Maybe I didn't might have been like on a slideshow of a talk I went to, but it was all kind of women in their fifties and sixties. And again, I was like, that's, that would, I wouldn't look like that. So it wasn't yeah. something I really identified with. So yeah, we've got a good age range on there. I think from 22, I'm not sure how, how high up we go, like 40 maybe at the moment, but it's always growing. <laughs> yeah. Anyone wants yeah. To donate pictures. Yeah. So, so if people want to have a look, the, the link will pop that on um, on for them to see. Um, this will go. This um, our chat will go on to Facebook Live as well, so people can access the link from there as well. Um, and also, just going back to our someone like me service, if you are interested, we'll put the link in in there as well. And or you can go on our website and just type in someone like me, and that will come up. And if there's any questions that um, that that you've run through i'm very aware that probably lots of questions will come up and i've not managed to read them out so um i'll endeavor to answer those tomorrow and if there is anything you just want to talk through again if people are concerned about their family history a starting point as well is always to ring us on the helpline you can speak to one of our nurses we'll be there from nine o'clock tomorrow morning so if if people want to do that the number will be in the in the link um i think have we discussed everything that we had planned to. I'm trying to think. Oh, so. um, yeah. Is there anything, any sort of top tips or any sort of words of wisdom that you you can think that we haven't discussed? I do. I always think what I would have said to my past self, and I feel like I spent a lot of time worrying, a lot of time worrying, and I wish, I just wish I could go back in time and tell myself that I still love my body, because I had this real thing like. You know this is the best my body's ever going to look it's never going to look this good again and I really thought I would hate myself and I don't like they you know they're not breasts but I've got something there and I've got a cleavage and I've got scars and I haven't got nipples but I, I love I love I love myself I love my <laughs> I love my body I love what I've got yeah. and I think the sense of like empowerment of taking control of your health and just feeling proud of yourself is is more than we, we're so obsessed with beauty and body image in this world and, and it's not about that and I think this has made me a better person without a doubt and I wouldn't change it so I, I wish I could go back so all the women who are like waiting and they're absolutely terrified and they're thinking this is the worst thing ever it's horrific and it's hard to go through but you will get through the other side and you will love yourself again and you know you'll find the positivity in this experience so that's my advice. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Kristen. It's been wonderful talking to you tonight and you thank sharing you your experience.
I'm Thank sure you. it's helped so many people um, who are who are watching live and also who may watch at a later stage once it's it's um, gone over to Facebook. Yeah, but yeah. Um, as I said before, if there's anything um, that's come up tonight that you did wanted to ask about, then either drop us a message um, in the in the box and we'll endeavour to respond to you as quickly as possible. And as I was saying right at the very beginning, we are currently doing a survey. So the link to the survey to evaluate our effectiveness on Instagram and Facebook Live, it, link in the bio if you can complete that at the end. Um, and all that I've left to say is join us next Thursday on Facebook um, for a live where we'll be talking all things chemotherapy. Thanks again, Kristen. Have Thank a lovely so evening. Much. I'll speak to you soon. Bye. 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 Bye.